Church, how we doing? Voice is hanging on by a thread. Thank you, refs. Uh, but I didn't sin, though. Some of you. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I know there's a lot of you out in the lobby, and when you were driving to church this morning, you probably were not anticipating watching from the lobby. And so I just I want to thank you for serving us in here, for being out there, and hopefully you're still going to be able to uh, get the message by way of, of that large screen out there. So thank you for joining us, parents that are coming from other places. We're so glad that you uh, get to, to be here and so that you can continue to pray for what God is doing in and through this place here in Waco, Texas and surrounding areas. If we haven't met, my name is JP or Jonathan Pakluda. It is a privilege to serve you. We're starting a new series this morning on Ecclesiastes. And there are these things in life that happen where you're trying to discern what is meaningful to you, what, what matters to you. And I'll give you a couple hypotheticals and I'll tell you one that's relevant to me, but it's like, what matters to me? What really matters to me? So one of these events is, is dying. So as a pastor, uh, you sit with people who are coming face to face with death. Sometimes they survived uh, a loved one who's passed away, or they just got that, that terrible news from the doctor that hey, you have two more months, three more months, six more months. And I have seen now many times just the way the priorities change. Okay, now I'm going to start living for something else. I, I want to prioritize my time in this way, prioritize my resources in this way, prioritize my conversations in this way. And so you begin to see in that moment with that diagnosis what really matters. Another one is like if your house was on fire, hypothetically speaking, someone said, hey, the house is on fire. And so you, you realize you're safe, but you go and you start grabbing things that, that matter most to you. Hey, I don't want this to be destroyed. Hey, let me grab this. Let me get this. This is what really matters. For us, uh, I, ha I haven't died, and, uh, and I'm still with you, and, and I haven't been in a fire, but we did move, okay? We did recently move. I told you this a couple of weeks ago. And so in moving, you're trying to sort your things, right? What's going with me? But our move is interesting because we're moving into a place temporarily for a year. And so the vast majority of our belongings went into storage and we tried to just grab those things that, that matter to us in the day to day, the things that we use. Does that make sense? So some stuff went with us in our rent house and, and most of our stuff went in storage, which is really just in our garage <laughs> stacked up. And so here's a picture of our garage. There it is. That is 117 boxes. If you're curious, uh, that's what 117 boxes looks like. And, and the reason that they're so disheveled, some of them opened and whatnot, is because it didn't work out perfectly, right? Uh, I, I got in the day-to-day -day life and I was like, where's my backpack, okay? My backpack has my computer in it, has outlines in it, has my Bible in it. I need to find my backpack and I can't find it in all of the things that we said matter to us in the day to day, which means I have to go tearing through those boxes in the garage. So I'm like, I'm, you know, you can imagine this. I'm, I'm opening the box because they're taped shut. I'm, I'm looking inside. They're labeled on the outside, but not one of them says backpack. Okay. <laughs> Somehow that got, and so I'm just, I'm looking into the boxes and this is, I'm about two hours in to this assignment. I'm going through a stack of boxes, right? Uh, where there, and Monica walks by and she says, hey, I packed those. I know it's not in there, right? Which isn't altogether that helpful because she didn't tell me where it was, but it is somewhat helpful because as I'm looking for it, I don't have to look in there. And so I'm, I'm now to 100 and 15 boxes instead of 170, and right, and, and as I go look somewhere else, she goes, no, I packed that one. I know it's not in there. And this is what Solomon is going to do for us over the next several weeks. He's in a search for meaning. He's trying to find the reason for living, and he's going to start looking into hypothetical boxes and he's going to tell you, he's going to look, come face to face with you and say, it's not in there. You do not need to look in there. 
And, and he doesn't actually tell us where it's found. He just slowly through 12 chapters, through 12 chapters tells us where it's not found. And he's going to ask some of the biggest questions that all of you ask. Why are we here? Why does it matter? What am I supposed to do with my life? And so this is a series that I think we really need. And so it's Ecclesiastes. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, we subtitled this, The Search for Meaning. Because that's what he's doing. He's searching for meaning. Uh, Ecclesiastes is a poetic book. And so you have Genesis through Nehemiah, the historical books. You have Isaiah through Malachi, the prophetic books. And then right there in the middle, you have the poetic books. You have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Uh, and so this is one of those poetic books or one of the books of wisdom within the poetic books, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's, it's 12 chapters of searching for meaning. I've titled the message today, The Search for Meaning Begins. And that's what we're talking about. The search begins as we're looking for meaning. And I, I, as I said, the book addresses life's biggest questions. Uh, he's going to talk about where not to search for meaning. And I want to say this to you. A wise person learns from their mistakes. Okay? A wiser person learns from the mistakes of others. And so we get to learn from the mistakes of the wisest person who has ever lived, well documented, the wisest person who has ever lived. We get to learn from his mistakes over the next several weeks together. One of the dumbest things that you can do, one of the worst things that you can do is leave here and repeat the experiment. Does that make sense? That would be like him saying, hey, it's not in that box and you spending the rest of your life searching in that box where he told you, you're not going to find meaning there. Repeating the experiment would be as foolish as, as like someone's pouring gasoline all over themselves and grabbing a match and say, let's see what happens. And you watch what happens and then you go, oh, I got to try that at home, right? That's what some of us do with this book. It is going to teach you where meaning is not found, and you're gonna be tempted to leave here and look for it there. Interesting things about Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter three, God shows up to him and says, what do you want? This is what all of us want to happen. It's like God shows up like a genie and just says, hey, what do you want? Make a wish, right? And Solomon says, I want wisdom to rule your people. And God was pleased with that answer, that he didn't ask for riches, that he didn't ask for fame, that he didn't ask for palaces, that he didn't ask for the envy of his enemies, that he didn't ask for women or pleasure, right? He didn't ask for those things. And so what God does is he opens the spigot of worldly blessings on his life. Like anything worldly that you could want, this man has significantly more than you will ever have or anyone you know will ever have. And it's just a fact. It's rooted in history. Like this guy really lived. He really was a king. Okay. Uh, he, uh, we could just talk about women. He, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Concubines are, are like a wife, but you don't have to buy them a Valentine's Day present. It's, it's like they don't have the, they don't have the, it's tr truly like the best way for me to describe it. They don't have the privileges that wives would have. So he's got 700 and 300 making a thousand wife equivalents, right? This guy makes Hugh Hefner look like a nun, right? <laughs> if you understand who Hugh Hefner is, he had seven wives, Solomon 700. He's good looking, like Ryan Gosling, okay? He, he dresses well, like Michael B. Jordan. Like even Jesus says in Matthew 6, hey, none of you are dressed as well as Solomon was a thousand years later. Like, I mean, that's when you're well dressed. If Jesus is talking about your drip, like you're well dressed. Like, let's just, I'm just saying, man. We could talk about money. Uh, he has more money than Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. 
and Bernard Arnault and Bill Gates combined. They don't come close to his $2.2 trillion net worth. You can go to secular websites today, websites that deny the resurrection or, or Christianity, and they would tell you, you could say, who is the wealthiest person that ever lived? And they will tell you King Solomon was. King Solomon is the wealthiest person who has ever lived. I, I just, his gardens, okay, his gardens, he created pools to water his gardens that now, 3,000 years after his life, you can go see them and they are still there. Look at this image from Google Maps. This is the Solomon's pools. That's what he used to water his vineyards. Here's a picture, like if you were to look at it uh, on the ground, okay? Those are still there. That's cute that you have a swimming pool. 3,000 years from now, it will not be there. A 1,000 years from now, a couple hundred years from now, your pool will not be there. 3,000 years. You can still go see his pool. He's the most powerful person in the world at this time, more powerful than the President of the United States of America. He single-handedly crashed the silver market. He had so much silver in his personal collection, it became... Uh, the equivalent of rocks, uh, just, he, he crashed it. And the dumbest thing that you can do is repeat the experiment. And the greatest thing that you can probably do with this text is to learn from it who God is and what he desires for your life. As I move through this text, we've got three points. They're all alliterations, like a good Baptist preacher. We're gonna talk about the rut we're stuck in, how we'll be remembered, and where our reason and rebellion get us. King Solomon wrote this, most uh, scholarship, vast majority of scholarship agrees. Some say he didn't, but it was written about his life. Regardless, Solomon is the subject, written about a thousand years before Jesus Christ shows up on the scene. So about a thousand BC, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse one. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, tells you who uh, is about to speak. That word for teacher is koalette. Uh, it, it means like philosophy professor. Because a good teacher explains. A good teacher answers questions. This book will not answer your questions. Okay? It will just ask them. Everybody has that friend, you know, that just asks all the questions. Well, what about? Well, why are we here? Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? You have a friend or an eight-year-old, right? Either one. They're asking those questions. Uh, interesting that the title Ecclesiastes means the same thing, the teacher, just like here, the teacher is who is saying this and he's big in the Socratic method. He's just questioning everything. And this is what he says. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Welcome to Harris Creek. <laughs> what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? This verse is key to understanding the rest of the chapters where it says, what do they gain? That word gain is referenced in this book 10 times and it translates literally profit. What do they profit at the end of their life? What is their excess? What can they take with them? What did they gain from their 76 or whatever years on this earth? What do they have to show for it? And then he says, when he says on this earth, he says under the sun, that phrase, under the sun, is in this text, in this, uh, this book, 28 times. And it's a metonymy. Does anybody know what a metonymy is? A metonymy is, is a phrase to describe a place. So like if I said, I love high school football, right? And I might say it like this. I might say, man, I love the Friday Night Lights. And I'm not talking about the, the show and you would know I was talking about high school football, that's a metonymy, Friday Night Lights is a metonymy. If I said, I'm gonna go to Silicon Valley, you know where I'm gonna go, but not because I told you the name, you know, of, of the, the literal name of the geography, but I described it with a phrase, or like, is it, man, Waco has church on every corner, we're a part of the Bible Belt, those are metonymies. So when he says under the sun, he's describing a place, he's describing the world. That's important to understand as we move in because he's gonna tell us where meaning is found or better said, where it's not found under the sun. Generations come and generations go, 
but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises again. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. And what he shows you is second grade science class, the water cycle. And he says, hey, the, the streams run into the ocean and the sun evaporates the, sun, the sea into the clouds and the clouds move over the mountains and rain down and the streams run back into the oceans and evaporate into the sky and it runs down and the earth turns about a thousand miles an hour as it orbits around the sun. The sun comes up and the sun goes down and the sun comes up and the sun goes down and as it turns, the wind blows to the south and turns to the north and and it does it all over again. So my first point is we are in a rut of relentless repetition. We're in a rut of relentless repetition. You can see the gears on the clock. If you've ever opened the inside of a clock, you see the gears turning, like spinning like planets around our solar system. Day after day, after year, after decade, after century, after millennia, like gears in the solar system. And the teeth on those gears will grind you up. They will chew you up in it. I'm so glad you're here. It looks like this. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, first period, second period, third period, fourth period, fifth period, sixth period, seventh period, eighth period, ninth grade, fall, winter, summer, uh, spring, summer, <laughs> fall, winter, spring, Summer, sun goes up, sun comes down. Sun goes up, sun comes down. This repetition, this is where you're stuck. All the way through college, and then the real rat race starts. Because the sun comes up, you wake up, you go to work. Sun goes down, you go to bed. Sun comes up, you wake up, you go to work. Sun goes down, you go to bed. And then the weekend, and then Monday, sun goes up and sun goes down. Sun goes up, sun goes down, right? And, and I'll tell you, I, a publisher came to me, it's not a plug, it's important, came to me and said, hey, you, we want you to write a book. What do you want to write on? And so you can write on anything you want to. And as I thought and prayed about that, first book I ever wrote or was published, I wanted to write the answer to the question of all of these young adults, these fresh from grad school, fresh from college, coming into my office, tears running down their face saying, is this all there is? Like, is this why I really went to school for my entire life? Just to work, to make somebody rich, the people at the top of this pyramid scheme called corporate America, they get their pockets fat and I just wake up and go to work and go home and go to bed? Is this all there is? So I wrote 12 chapters of Yes, <laughs> there you go, right? Because, because then you have kids and the sun goes up and you wake up and you pack lunches and you become an Uber driver and, and then you go to work yourself only to be an Uber driver again, to go home, to clean the house, to mow the lawn, the sun goes down, you go to bed and then you die. And this is the cycle that we're stuck in. So listen, some of you, you came in today, you're, you're watching right now, and you know you feel this low hum of despair in your life, and you're like, why? Why can I not find joy? Why can I not find happiness? Why can I not find meaning? And I'll just say, because you're looking for it in the wrong places. You're searching in the wrong boxes. It's not there. It's not there. Generations come and generations go. But the grinder remains. 
you become worm food. You tracking? Like the greatest apex predator there is, the earthworm. Because the earthworm eats lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. And he will eat you. Welcome to Harris Creek. <laughs> the eye never has enough seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. He's saying we're always looking for something new. We, we turn the corner, we, we're trying to find something new. What has been will begin again. I'm sorry, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And you might think, no, man, there's, there's new things all the time. Like we can build a new house and live in a new school or, or go to a new school. Right? And he's like, we are ants in an ant farm. Have you ever seen this? Like a window the ants live in and they go and they dig a tunnel. They, they move one piece of grain, behind, a grain of sand behind them and another piece of grain of sand behind them and they dig a hole and they say, look, a new hole. And you're looking at the side and you're like, no, it's just like your old hole right beside the new hole. You're just doing what all the other ants before you did. There's nothing new. And you say, wait, wait, there is something new. The iPhone 13. I say, they just moved the camera and made it faster. That's the iPhone 12, right? It, it, we've been communicating for decades and centuries and millennia past. What he says, is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before your time. Let me prove it to you. You're going to hear right now in our culture all the time, unprecedented, unprecedented pandemic. You ever heard of the bubonic plague? 200 million people died. Okay, Spanish fever, yellow fever, or Spanish flu, yellow fever, cholera, black plague. We, we, it's just new to us. It's just new, you'll, you'll see here, unprecedented division. Unprecedented division in our country. In our nation's history, this is unprecedented division. There was this thing in the 1860s where we were walking around with muskets shooting each other. Okay? I, I don't think it's, it's just new to us. That's how we see the world. If it's new to us, it must be brand new. Never happened before. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. It's important. It's important. How many of you, how many of you know the names of your grandparents? How many of you know the names of your grandparents? Okay, thank you. It's a lot. How many of you know the names of their grandparents? Not their parents, but their grandparents. Okay, that's a whole lot less of you. Your kids' kids, they may know your name. Their kids will not. Your kids' kids, they may do that project where they gotta draw the tree and, and, and in their entire existence of 76 years on this earth, they might ask two questions about you because they needed it for a grade. Their kids won't. They won't, they won't even know your name. They will be sitting in a sermon 50 years from now and someone will say, do you know your, your grandparents? And they'll raise their hand and someone will say, do you know your, your grandparents' grandparents? And they, will, they won't know you. That's you, by the way, in the story. That's your role. And it's super heavy on one hand, but it's incredibly liberating on the other. Because right now, take a, everybody take a deep breath. And exhale, you don't have to be remembered. It's okay. You can stop striving because it's, it's, you're not going to. If you get the name, your name on buildings, those buildings will topple 
like your swimming pool. It, it's going to be fine. Our routine will not be remembered. That's my second point. Our routine will not be remembered. So not only is it meaningless, but it will also not be remembered. Nothing is forever, and you know this, nothing is forever, right? There, there's permanent markers, permanent, permanent. But then you got the magic eraser, right? And I know some of you are still working on that, right? But, but like super glue, super glue, never, un, uh, if, you know, praise God, uh, it's not so super, otherwise my hands would still be stuck together. Uh, vows, right? No, forever, no. Even if you make it to the finish line, there's no marriage in heaven. A perm? Short for permanent. Praise God it's not. Diamonds are not forever. That name you wrote in the concrete when you were in the seventh grade, it's not forever. Every week I write my sermon notes on a whiteboard and the, the entire message starts on a whiteboard. Um, we come together, we work on the message for hours, ultimately like the, where we're gonna start, where we're gonna go, uh, interpretive challenges in the text, to try to come up with points. All of this ends up on the whiteboard as this picture, a story that we're gonna take you on through the text, right? And anybody who teaches up here goes through that same process. And, and then at the end of that meeting, take a picture with my phone, and then someone comes behind me and erases it. Because when I walk in there the next week, it's no longer there. And this is a picture of our lives, that we're putting things on the whiteboard. We, they're, they're, it, we are in our hometown, and it's just this life map, and we grew, grew up here, worked, went to school here, worked here. Here's our children. There's their names, right? Here's our, our, our golden retriever, our 2021, our golden doodle. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, here it is. This is the picture. And then one day you're going to come in a room like this, but you'll be wheeled in or carried in by six people. And, and, and those that are still alive who are close to you will come around you and they'll say some kind things about you. But make no mistake about it, it was something on their calendar that they felt they needed to be at. And they'll leave here and they'll get in a row of cars and they'll drive to a plot of land where they've dug a hole and they'll place you in it. At the end of this race, you get a rock with your name on it that no one visits. That's the truth. That's the truth. Like that, that, that we, have to, we have to feel that. And, and they, it's like they will walk up to that whiteboard just erase it for someone else to draw on it after you. Entire civilizations have been forgotten. Our family, we, well, our family, Monica and I go to Mexico every year. That's just a place that we retreat to. Since we went there on our honeymoon, we've gone there every year since. I love it. And um, when I go, I try to visit uh, the Mayan ruins. I really enjoy that aspect of, of Mexico's history, that there's this entire civilization that has been wiped out. They're not there anymore. And one of the ruins, one of my favorites, is called Ekbalam. And the reason it's one of my favorites is because it was only recently discovered. So in recent history did they find this entire city, this city with grocery stores and schools and these giant pyramids much bigger than this room were completely hidden for centuries by the jungle. No one knew that it was there. Like vines had just grown over it and people, like even Google satellites didn't pick up on it. They didn't know it was there. And now they've uncovered this and there's this huge city that exists that you can go and visit. And you, it's these people that have been forgotten, you say, no, wait, wait, they haven't been forgotten because you can go visit it. But make no mistake about it, the jungle will cover it again. And the very rocks that built those pyramids will disintegrate into sand. And, and the city that once was thriving with so many people will be forgotten. And so will ours. Listen, so will ours. Don't you understand? Like, like centuries from now, people are going to be looking at Waco and they're like, what are the, those are silos? What, are, what did they use those for? 
oh, like communicating with aliens? No, nah, I don't think so. They'll be looking at it like a Stonehenge, you know? Like communicating with aliens? No, nah, it's like where you went. It's like buy candles and stuff. <laughs> They're like in silos? Grain silos? And you're like, you're trying to explain. They'll be trying to make sense of something that's very normal to us because we're gone. I, verse 12, I, the teacher, was a king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. Let me say this right here. Up until right now, it's just been set up for the experiment. And now we're going into the experiment. He's starting to open boxes. Okay. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. Why would he do that? Why would he lay this heavy burden on us? So that we would seek him and we would find him. I have seen all the heavens that are, uh, all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. He, he's talking about, he's been talking about um, creation and nature and he's saying our greatest reason cannot fix that which is lacking in nature. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ever ruled Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. The word that's repeat here, repeated here 28 times is the word meaningless is the Hebrew word havel. And havel literally translates into our language a, a smoke or a vapor. It is to grab in your hand, to grip smoke. That, that's what he's, as he starts this experiment, he says, this is what you're doing if you continue to search in the boxes from which I have searched. You're grabbing smoke. You're, you're trying to possess vapor. For, much, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Blessed are the naive, for they do not know what's going on. Blessed are the naive, for they do not know what's going on. Because when you start peeling back the layers, you start to see death and disease and decay and despair and sorrow and heartbreak and breakups and sadness and things that don't last forever under the sun. Let me say this real quick here. Ecclesiastes is a challenging book to teach because it repeats itself. He cycles he says ideas and he goes, back, he goes back and revisits them. And so we won't expound on everything. Like sometimes you'll have to stay with us. If you miss a, a week, you can go on the Harris Creek app and catch up. You can go on the website and catch up. And so this is week one. But like in chapter two, he says this. Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can a king's successor do than what has already been done? Again, so he's going to come back to these ideas. But my third and final point today in this text, is our reason and rebellion are, ridic are ridiculous. Our reason and our rebellion are ridiculous. And the way that he got to that conclusion is he explored two paths. The first one is he says, I wanna go learn everything I can learn. I'm gonna run these experiments. I'm gonna go be formally educated, right? And here in Waco, we value formal education because at the center of our city is a great university that has benefited so many of us, so many of you. Some of you are employed there. Your entire uh, job, your career path is rooted in helping people be educated. And so we value that. And I'll say this, to train the mind, to sharpen the mind is a great thing. To want to have a sharper mind, I've heard it said, the Holy Spirit has an affinity for the trained mind. To sharpen your mind is a great thing. To make your mind an idol will leave you in the deepest, darkest despair you can ever consider. You understand? Because your mind too is stuck in the gears. It too will fade and you will not only not remember where you put your car keys, but you will forget that you have a car what kind of car it is, you will forget the names of your children and you will not recognize them. 
And when you make your mind an idol, there's a despair that sits under that that is so incredibly deep and dark and heavy. So good to sharpen it. Don't worship it. Here's what he's saying. I did it right. I learned lots. I excelled in school. I got the diploma. I read. I I was promoted. I had the corner office. I was summa cum laude. I became king. My education afforded me the ability to be the most powerful person in the land. And what I have to say about that is it's meaningless. It left me wanting, some of you, you're here, and, and you know, you're like, man, I'm so, I'm so smart, but nobody wants to be around me, because I know it all. And I really thought they were gonna appreciate somebody that knew it all, but it just doesn't seem like they do. You get into that last quarter of life, and you, you, you become intolerable to the people around you, because you know better than everyone else. And the things that you fed yourself, that you paid so much money and so much time to gain has now actually cost you. He says, I rebelled. I partied. I had I participated in orgies and drugs, sex. I hit scruffs on the weekend. And then I went to Showtime over on LaSalle. I partied on barges on Lake Waco. And I took shots at crickets and drank all of the drafts that they have to offer. And what I want you to know is it's meaningless. It left me with the hangover, hugging a toilet, wanting more. And what's worse is I got stuck in it. Wash, rinse, repeat. I I actually looked forward to that which was going to poison me so that my body would reject it so that on Friday or Thursday I could do it all over again. Sin robs you of creativity. You get stuck in that relentless cycle. Constantly, oh man, it's gonna be amazing. $130 bar tab and a hangover. That's life, yeah. And I speak from experience. Let me just say that in the city. Got arrested right across the street from the Farrell Center. Okay, I've seen the inside of the Highway 6 jail. Uh, I've looked for life in alcohol, in the party scene, in drugs, in sex. I ran that side of the experiment. Some of you, you ran the education experiment, right? You're here, you're like, man, I've got doctorates on doctorates, right? I've got so many letters behind my name, it's like the alphabet sitting there in my signature. And, and both of them, Solomon is telling you, is meaningless. He's comparing the two. He's, he's, he's pitting the Val de Victorian against the president of their sorority fraternity, you know, and they're fighting. And some of you are like, well, can you be both? You were both. You excelled in both of those things. You, you're, I know you're here, right? You, you, you partied hard and somehow made the grade. You're that smart. And it's still meaningless. He says, I must live for something beyond myself. Some of you, you're here. You, you squeaked into church on a Sunday morning, but you know that in your heart of hearts, you believe that when you die, the lights just go out. So this is really all there is and you feel a deep despair right now. And to you, what I, want you to, what I want you to hear me say is, you should. You should. If this is all there is, then what are we doing? If you know my God, right? If you know the one true God, then this is just a commercial of heaven. This is the, the greatest moments here are just commercials for where we will be in his presence forever and ever and ever and ever. But if you do not know that one true God through his son, Jesus Christ, then this is the only heaven you will ever sense. The one with death, disease, sickness, and sorrow. It's the only flavor of heaven you will ever experience. And so I plead with you to know him In summary, we are in a rut 
of relentless repetition. Our routine will not be remembered and our reason and rebellion are ridiculous. For centuries, Greek philosophers would sit outside the city and ask a question. What is the logos of life? This is what they would ask, the Greek word logos. What is the logos of life? Now, if you've been in Sunday school long or church long, you know the word logos, it translates word but it also translates reason. And that's why they would ask this. They were asking for centuries, what is the logos of life? They're trying to figure it out. So you can imagine, they're, they're asking what you ask. I mean, every person asks this, right? When they're, everyone, right? They ask this question, what is, why am I here? What am I doing? What's the point of it all? Does it matter? Am I doing it the right way? What is the logos of life? So you can imagine God and his kindness to offer the clarity in John chapter one, verse one. When he says, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Talking about Jesus. He goes on to say, the Logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He's telling you something really important. You're not going to find meaning separate and apart from Jesus. You just will not. Like a fish was made for water, you, the only purpose that you will be able to find is through the sun. You will not find it under the S-U-N. You know, do you hear me? The atheist would say about you, your faith is a crutch. The, the only reason you have religion is to find purpose here. That you can't find purpose here without your faith. To that last statement, what I would say, Mr. Atheist, you're absolutely correct because the moral atheist makes no sense to me. Well, I just wanna make the world a better place. Why? And who gets to decide what better means? Is better drenching it in gasoline and lighting it on fire? Why is that not better? Why do you get to decide what's better? It seems there's another place beyond the sun. And I'm telling you, you will only find meaning there. And so as I'm looking for my backpack, you can imagine if Monica says, hey, it's not in that box. It's not in that box. It's not in that box either. In fact, your backpack's not in here. It's not in the storage container. Right? How foolish would I be to continue to spend hours and days looking for it in that storage container? That's what Solomon's doing. Say, hey, you're looking for meaning under the sun, in the earth. You're not gonna find it there. The only place you're gonna find it is beyond the sun, outside the sun. It's not in that storage container, it's past it. And so you and I might be like, oh, well, great. Well, let's go see it. Ah, you can't go yet. You can't go there yet. But you can talk to someone who's there anytime you want. It's called prayer. Uh, you, you can't go where meaning is found, but you can, there's been a book written about it. You can read it and study it and learn to live according to it and find why you're here and how to live here. God, God was so kind that all of the meaning that's found in that storage container has been documented in a book and given to you. you. You can't go where meaning is found yet, but you can circle up with others who are looking for meaning in the same way that you are, and they too have found where it is. And you can gather with them in these things we call churches and yoke yourself to them. And they can remind you repeatedly that it will not be found in your education. It will not be found in your rebellion. That's the first place we're gonna look today as we tear through these boxes. He says, you don't need to look in those two boxes because any eternal significance will not be found there. Make sure that's not most who you are. Make sure there's something that marks you beyond that. Let me pray that you would. And Father, would you help us believe that, know that to be true? Would you stir in our hearts direction and reason and help us not to get to the bottom of any box, see that it's empty and keep looking? Help us to not keep searching 
in areas you've told us not to search for meaning? Would you fill our hearts with hope? Would you fill our hearts with peace? Would you fill our hearts with faith? And God, as we sing, I know you gave us our vocal cords that the Father, Son, and Spirit tuned us as musical instruments to sing of your glory. Lord, help us to redeem that which the enemy has tried to steal, to sing of the hope that we have, to sing now and to sing forever. Amen.